Hi everyone, good evening. This session will go for about an hour, maybe a little bit longer. It's our first one, we'll see how long it takes. Uh, we'll be covering um, heel cup options. Uh, why would we choose the top of heel cups that we do? Um, and also the arch fill techniques uh, that will be covered today. Um, and degrees of correction, um, we'll cover that as well. So it's a quite a big one, it's probably the biggest one that we have. Um, for those that haven't used us before, we'll be using our portal to show you the modifications, how you ask for them. Um, all our orders, well, 99% of our orders come through the portal now, even though if you don't have a scanner, you're taking plaster cast, you can still use our portal. If you don't have access to it, um, you don't have an account with us, simply send us an email, we'll set you up um, and everything will be set up. If you've been dealing with us and sending in paper scripts, um, as a very small handful still do, if you've been sending uh, those type of scripts to us, you do have a portal account set up because all of our orders, get transferred onto the portal anyway manually here in the office. So um, if you want access to the portal, just um, send us an email again and, and we'll fix it up for you. But you can use the portal with, uh, with plaster casts or non-scanning techniques. So the topics that we'll be covering today, like I mentioned, we'll just go start off with the basics. So on our portal, um, he's, he's the one that I use It's as a footwork podiatrist. We see the odd patient that we do. I've just scanned one of my sons. Um, He's been waiting for six months for orthotics. Now, like every, every uh, plumber's got a leaky tap or my kids need orthotics. So uh, we finally scanned as a prescription there for him. So patient details, first name, surname, age, shoe size, gender, footwear type. Why do we need the age and the shoe size? Um, it's to double check, make sure that you've uploaded the right scans. About once a week, we do catch where a podiatrist will upload. It's actually probably getting less and less now. Podiatrists are getting a little bit better at it. Uh, where well, they've uploaded the wrong scans, they'll have an age of a five-year-old shoe size three and we'll get a scan for a US size 12 male. Uh, male. So we know there's a problem there. Uh, footwear type starts you thinking about the type of prescription that you want to do. So if you want to, if you're going to put the football boots, you're not going to be uh, manufacturing a chunky orthotic that's not going to fit into a football boot. So it gets your mindset going in that direction. Um, orthotics for both feet. Um, we can do orthotics for left or right foot only. That's um, if there's an amputation, patient's got an amputation, or if they have an AFO on the other foot, it's quite a common way of doing that too. When we move into the podiatrist, that's a clinic. So we've got our clinic in here. Up. Um, it's not a clinic, it's just our office, but nowhere to send it to. And I'm a footwork podiatrist. So that, the podiatrists that work with us at footwork use that as well. Purchase order number is, um, is done for, um, if you're working in a community health center, or a public hospital, quite often they'll require purchase order numbers is where you put it in. But also if you have a visiting podiatrist, like a student in working in your private practice, so you can put their name in there so it goes on the script and on your records. So uh, let's go into our heel cup shapes. So with our heel cup shapes is what I'm talking about. And so if you have a, set up your screen so you can see me speaking, because I'll be presenting some physical examples of orthotics as well but also on the main screen, if you can have the actual screen where the portal is on, because I'll be showing the software and how we design. So uh, what I'm talking about is the pretty much the basic heel cup shape of the orthotic. And with us, you can have a standard heel cup, what we call a traditional. You can have a, uh, what we call a concave wedge, which is a very low bulk, low profile uh, orthotic, um, uh, low bulk heel cup. It literally looks like a soup spoon. So it's a, uh, there's still concavity through the surface under the heel. So the surface under the, on the plantar surface of the heel is the same curvature as that of a traditional orthotic, but doesn't have the walls. So it doesn't uh, give you, gives you much less issues with shoe fit, um, gives you much less issues uh, with potential heel pinching. If you want a narrow orthotic, then it's, you know, sometimes you might need an orthotic that's actually narrower than the foot itself to squeeze it into a football boot or a cycling shoe, etc. So we'll go through that now. So a traditional orthotic, as we describe it, has got a, on average, 12 to 14, 15 mil heel cup height, depending on the size of the foot. You can specify the heel cup height as well. And when we measure the heel cup height, we'll measure it at the back. So if you get inversion or eversion, it doesn't get affected as much. So with a highly inverted orthotic, obviously the medial heel cup will be higher and we'll have to counteract it on the lateral side as well. But we measure the heel cup right at the back. How do we design our orthotics? So let's do a quick start on um, share a video, share my screen here. So I'll show you, present to you how we actually start doing our designs and we'll start doing that so you get a bit of an understanding. 
for those who haven't seen it. So we'll go file, we import um, an SDL file. So we'll go into one that I've got stored. We'll go into, so I should have preset the new folder. We'll try that one. So there's a scan that's taken on, um, on the iPad scanner, on the structure scanner. As you can see, it's a really good scan. Um, the podiatrist actually went a little bit overboard and scanned on the dorsum of the foot. That's not really required because we're not pouring it. So with plaster, so you don't have to have it, but that podiatrist went to extreme lengths. Um, unfortunately, not all the scans are as nice as this one, but as you can see, um, if you take care of it, it gives you a really, really good scan. So the first thing that we do is we actually line it up in the, prop, in the proper planes. So it sits well in our software. So we line it up so it sits like that. We're going to posterior view. And now we will also line it up so we get the rear foot in zero. Um, we have a different view like that so we can see it a little bit more. So that's probably a little bit overdone. So a bit too much inversion there. So there, align it to base. So every scan we buy, we, we balance to rear foot zero and that's how we begin, begin our design process. We then place markers on the scan, which is um, we place one in the heel, one in the fifth MTPJ, one in the second. And we also place a marker roughly where we want the high point of the arch to be. And what that gives us is an outline of what the orthotic profile will be like. And that's what our junior podiatrist, that's what Baz and, and Jess do. Uh, they set these scans up for us and, and they trim the scans, make phone calls to podiatrists. Um, if there's any questions to be made regarding the script, if you want anything clarified or they pick something up that doesn't make sense, they catch all that. They, it's literally a triage area. But they also uh, set it all up, so uh, marking all the anatomical markers and so forth. So now that looks a little bit wide to me, so I'll trim it a little bit on the medial side. The heel expansion, I... Um, I can bring that in a little bit more and shift it so it's mainly on the lateral side as, as it would be when we were manufacturing the orthotics by hand with plaster. So everything that we design the software, we try to do it um, the same way as we, I was taught doing plaster, you know, 25, 30 years ago. So the, the procedure is pretty much the same. So we put the nails in, determine the shape of the orthotic that we want it to be. And then we generate curves and when we generate curves, uh, we work with a skeleton because a skeleton for us worked out is much easier to change the shape, to control the shape and generate any shape that we want. So as you can see from the image here, um, what you can see the green line is a, we've put a vertical wall up so we can actually see where the orthotic surface would finish or the virtual plaster would, how it meets up against a foot. So as you can see, that gives me a really nice contour to the foot. So um, if I remove the vertical wall, it's really hard to see uh, what I'm looking at. But with the vertical wall, once we put it in, it gives us a, a really nice clean image of how the actual arch height meets up with the foot itself. So we can then adjust it uh, and, and change everything and, and so forth. So in the top right hand corner, you can see measurements. So it gives me the length measurements diameter, forefoot width, midfoot width, medial arch height, lateral arch height, and the actual lateral heel cup height. So all those measurements, and this software is really fast and responsive. So as I'm moving, you can see the arch height, arch height moving and so forth. So let's begin um, with our standard heel cup height. So with our heel cups, and I'll change that into posterior. So what we're looking at here is again, a skeleton of the orthotic with a see-through, so I'll get a nice, see through image how the orthotic actually is behaving through the scan itself and where it's putting pressure. But that would be our traditional heel cup orthotic, okay? In that case, it's 15 millimeters high. If I wanted to drop it, I use a little trick where I will bring the bottom of the orthotic up and posterior, line it up back to the ground, bring that up and I've brought it down to 14 mil, which is the average that we do. So there's my traditional heel cup orthotic. So if we go back into, uh, hang on a sec. If you go back into share screens and we go back into this one. So there's our traditional heel cup orthotic, okay? Now with the traditional heel cup orthotic, when I would use it, predominantly I would use it if I want to encompass the fat pad of the heel. So plantar heel pain um, is, is my first tick box is a traditional heel cup. 
I don't want to use any sort of a concave wedge or wedge device with plantar heel pain or enthesopathy because I want to be able to encapsulate and spread that weight around the heel, not having a direct contact um, onto the medial calc tubicle. Um, but with the traditional, we've then got sub options. So you've got a standard heel cup, which we've just um, showed you. You then have an option for a high medial heel cup, or a high medial and lateral heel cup, or a long lateral heel cup. So let's show you how we would do those and what they look like, and maybe discuss some cases where you may be wanting to use it with. So with a high medial heel cup, so I'll go back into curves. So I've just increased that medial heel cup higher. If I go into posterior view, just tidy that up a little bit and tidy that up a little bit. And if I create a mesh, you'll be able to see that I've got a really nice higher medial heel cup through here. And some podiatrists will want that just to create a little bit more support. It's almost like a mini UCBL on the medial side and just gives you that little bit more support on the medial side of the orthotic, stops your foot sliding around a little bit. It does make the orthotic a little bit more bulkier. Deeper heel cups make the device slightly bulkier, although the shoe does open up as we go higher. So it's not quite, it's not actually that much of a problem fitting into shoes. Um, however, where it becomes a problem with deeper heel cups is with certain top covers, such as Spanko, or in particular, three mil Spanko, where we have to allow for that extra thickness of the Spanko to be accommodated inside the heel cup. So keep that in mind that a deeper heel cup or a traditional orthotic with a material such as Spanko will require an extra heel expansion and that's what will take care of that in his house. Uh, but the orthotic will be slightly wider. So there's your high medial heel cup. On the high medial and lateral heel cup, well then on the lateral side, we bring the lateral heel cup up to around 20 millimeters. So there's 18, 19 and 20. And then we balance it out on the lateral side there. Um, going to posterior view, I'll just tidy that up a little bit. And if I go into mesh, and there's my high medial and a high lateral heel cup. So it's almost like a, again, a, a mini UCBL device. Um, really captures that heel fat pad um, nicely. Again, a little bit extra bulk, but does give you a little bit more control if that's what you're looking, after, uh, looking out for. And a long lateral heel cup, we extend the length of the heel cup halfway down the, um, the fifth mesh. So we we'll literally push it all the way up and if I go into posterior view and just bring that out and create a mesh, give you an image. So there's my long lateral heel cup where the heel cup will go be extended halfway down the fifth mat. And that just creates a, a, a nice uh, lateral force on the foot. Um, cases such as lateral ankle sprains, um, um, dysfunctional um, um, uh, perineals um, and so forth, if you want to really sort of put a lot of lateral wedging onto the foot, a higher lateral heel cup works really, really well. Um, a higher lateral heel cup is an option on its own. You don't have to have it with a, a high medial heel cup. Um, so they are, these are the options that we have for our traditional heel cups. Um, and again, you can specify any arch heights. If you want to get really specific and say, I want that high lateral heel cup um, to be, you know, 25 mil or 30 mil high. Yep, can we do it? Yep, of course we can. Um, and we do get that quite often. So for example, this one we've pushed out to 30 millimeters. If I create the mesh, and there's my high lateral heel cup of 30 millimeters. So we can do that with 3D printing. As if we can design it, we can print it. So um, we'll have to tidy it up a little bit because I've pushed it in into the scan. Um, but of course we'll, we'll do that in house. So this is just a quicker demonstration of, of what we can do. Now, um, the next one on the list is a concave wedge. So a concave wedge, well, like I showed you with the um, physical orthotic I had previously, is just a really, really low, low bulk heel cup, um, around sort of the 10, uh, eight to 10 millimeters high, um, maybe even lower in some cases, like this one works out to be on the lateral side about seven mil. And if I create my mesh, a, lateral, a concave wedge still gives me that curvature on the plantar surface. So it looks like a soup spoon um, and we can still put an aperture through it to drop it lower inside the shoe. However, it does not bulk the device up. 
And now you can clearly see how much room or expansion we've got there. So with a concave wedge, we can come in with the width a little bit more as well. And that gives us better fit for shoes. Um, again, business shoes, women's dress shoes. If you have a patient that has got a really wide heel, you know, it, if you ask for a, a traditional orthotic, I'm going to have to, we're going to, we're going to have to design an orthotic that's going to encompass that wide heel, um, no matter what shoes they go into. So with a concave wedge, you do have that option to be able to make the orthotic slightly narrower and uh, not risk any problems with heel pinching. Um, for me, I would personally use a concave wedge most of the time, um, unless, like I said at the start, patients have got a plantar heel pain or you know, some sort of a uh, heel injury or fat pad atrophy where you want to encompass and squeeze it. Uh, but for general orthotics, um, I'd go a concave wedge pretty much all the time because it reduces any problems with shoe fit. And if I want to locate the, um, the heel centrally on the orthotic, I don't want, to, want it moving around. Well, the first thing I suggest to a patient is make sure that you've got shoes with a solid heel counter. There's your heel cup. With a concave wedge, you, there's an option for a concave wedge with a lateral heel cup. And what we do there is just literally add a lateral heel cup uh, to the design. Um, so it stops the foot sliding off laterally um, um, on the orthotic itself. So if we just fix that up and pull that down and pull that away and create a mesh. So there's my concave wedge with a lateral heel cup. So what it gives us, it gives us again, a really low bulk device. Um, we do have to um, add a little bit more heel expansion. We can't go as narrow of a concave wedge with a lateral heel cup as we can with a normal concave wedge because of the lateral heel cup and we don't want to create any, any pinching or any irritation along the lateral border. Um, it is pretty much the width of a traditional orthotic as far as how narrow we can go with it. Uh, but what does give you, it reduce, removes a lot of the bulk from the medial side and at the back. So what we find quite often is that the back of the heel cup can push the orthotic forward in a shoe. Whereas if we drop the heel cup at the back and create a concave wedge, it does sit back in the shoe much better. Um, and one of the new options that we'll be releasing here shortly at Footwork is what we're finding with a lot of shoes such as Asics, the, the new Kianos and, and, and the new Nikes, um, they tend to be very tapered at the back. Um, so you'll be able to ask for your authority, uh, for your heel designs to be more tapered. Now you can ask for that now, um, for your heel cup to be tapered um, or a little bit points here. You can do that in comment section and we literally design it so it's a little bit more pointy, a little bit more tapered. And that can be done with any type of heel cup. You know, that's just a feature of a heel shape design. So there's your concave wedge with a lateral heel cup. So the next one on the list is a wedge device. Now, a straight wedge device, also known as a, a DC wedge, which was developed in Melbourne by um, the orthotic laboratory of Foot Tech, um, which is about 25, 30 years ago, is a device that um, DC stands for um, direct control, um, from what I was told. Um, but what we find is that the heel cup is very, very flat. So all these designs here I've done are done around the sort of zero degree. And we do get a number of podiatrists asking for wedge devices. And this is how, if I was to design a wedge device, this is how we would do it. Asking for wedge devices from what I perceive to be, um, they're wanting a low bulk device. Well, a wedge device doesn't reduce the bulk uh, that much. If anything, it tends to lift the orthotic inside the shoe. Um, so I'm be doing a bit of a change design while I'm talking to you. That one does is a little bit more finick, a bit more marking around to get to. Um, it requires a little bit more work, but we really just flatten out the, the plantar surface of the um, all right, hang on a sec. Um, the plantar surface of, of the device. Um, so as you can see, if I go into posterior view and create my mesh. It's a much flatter orthotic surface, okay? Now, uh, the, whole, the whole design of the DC wedge was to, so you get a direct control on the heel, and we do that by inverting the orthotic. Now, as I'm inverting it, I'm pushing up a flat surface into the heel. So I'm literally lifting that heel up in the shoe because I'm just, I've got a flat surface pushing up against it. So 
um, does it actually reduce the bulk as compared to a concave wedge? No, it actually adds more bulk to the device or makes it harder to fit into shoes because you're going to end up with problems such as um, early heel lift or the heel slipping out of the shoe because we've lifted that heel in, uh, on top of the device. So with a concave wedge, all we do is just create a little bit more of a sag in here and the foot then can sag and, and drop lower inside the shoe, but we've still got the angle generated on it. So with a, a DC wedge or a wedge device, it is more direct control. It's a much flatter surface. It might give you a couple of extra percent of correction in the refoot once you start going, you know, 10 plus degrees. But um, I'm not a big fan of it because it, like I said, it does provide a really direct pressure flat surface under the heel. And it was mainly designed from what I, again, from what I was taught at uni, it was mainly designed for people who are on the move. So predominantly kids, um, you do not want to be using a wedge device with elderly. People have got atrophy of the um, fibro fatty padding um, because it is just a direct pressure, direct flat piece of plastic underneath that foot. So please be careful of it. I mean, we literally would make one or two a week of these, but there are still put arteries. And again, from what I can see, they want to uh, develop or they want a device that's slightly lower bulk. So um, keep away from uh, straight wedge devices. There are better options in my opinion. Okay, so that's a wedge device. So keep away from it. Um, it's one of those things whether we, we think about do we remove it from the prescription form in the right instance? Yeah, look, our, our Joey devices, our, especially our Joey original inverted are more wedgy than a concave wedge simply because it's designed to, to give you maximum control and they are higher inversion devices. But uh, as, as a custom made device, I think you can do it a lot better. Um, and that's what it's about at the end of the day. You know, you can do it one way, but is there a better way to do it? If there's a better way to do it, do it better. Um, so there's your concave wedge. Um, let me just have a look where we were up to on the, um, on the prescription form. So I'll share screens. So we've got a, we've covered a traditional heel cup. We've covered a concave wedge. We've covered a wedge. We've got a cord full, cord hook and a cord full heel. Now, so if I go back into zero and concave wedge, we'll start off with a cord full heel, okay? So a cord full heel device is a concave wedge that is really, really narrow. Um, so it's just a device that we designed and how narrow is it? Well, we give you zero, degree, zero millimeters of heel expansion. So we give you the, um, the expansion of a um, whatever the heel is, that's what we give you. Um, and give, makes it for a very narrow device. Again, women's dress shoes, um, football boots, um, and so forth, really low profile shoes. But that is designed around the, um, it is designed around the scan of the foot itself. So as you can see, I've got barely any heel expansion in there, okay? Um, and there is no problems with heel pinching because again, there is no heel cup. Um, but it, it's the device that is designed to fit into low profile shoes, but it is designed around the width of the heel. So if you've got a patient who's got a really narrow heel and you ask for a full heel cord tonic, you're going to end up with a really, really narrow device. Okay, so it's something that you will use with a foot that's a standard width or slightly wider. Uh, I wouldn't be using it with a really narrow foot, particularly a narrow heel because we do cut it fairly straight. Now, a, um, a cord hook on the other side um, is something that um, we literally, some people will know it as a cobra. We call it a cord hook. So again, it's all design, done in design the software. What a cord hook allows us to do is generate this um, hook cutout which allows us to A, make the device a lot narrower, but also by generating a really narrow, narrow neck uh, at the device, we can actually bend it um, and generate a fairly high heel pitch. So we can stick um, that device into shoes, you know, two, three, four, uh, and plus mule of heel pitch um, to go into, uh, we've put these into ballroom dancing shoes and so forth. Now, most of these devices will be, um, as a secondary device to the patient where they'll have a standard orthotic that will go into their running shoes or the general shoes and they'll have a second pair of a cord hook 
that were going to the dress shoes when they were around the office and so forth. Um, I've seen some cases, discussions on, on the social media where people say, oh, they can use them for cycling shoes because it's a lower profile. Um, look, we, we manufacture cycling orthotics and, and cycling orthotic works totally different to the way that we actually um, look at the pressure distribution on a normal walking or running orthotic. So uh, we actually look at um, a lot of lateral wedging in the cycling orthotic in order to be able to lock the foot up and generate a rigid lever within the cycling shoe. So as you can see with this type of device, there isn't much of a lateral wedging. Um, that's not to say it doesn't stop podiatrists from wanting it. So if you want lateral wedging in a device, go for a cord full heel. Now, they are both just as low bulk. Um, and the only differences between the two is that the cord hook, you can fit into a higher heel shoe. With a cord full heel, we can't really generate that much of a bend through it because once we do that, it starts popping out through the midfoot um, and gets a little bit of a lump through there and gets pretty uncomfortable. Whereas with a cord hook, we can actually bend it because there's nothing there, nothing actually pops out around the sort of calf keyboard joint area. So, um, and with a cord full heel, we can add lateral wedging to it. We can add a keyboard notch, transfer fifth ray grind, four foot valgus posting, and so forth. Um, whereas with a cord hook, we cannot do that. So it is a secondary device. Most of the time, well, if I was to make one, I would never probably even worry about heel stabilizers. It's not what it's there for. It's just simply most of the patients um, want a low profile device in a, in a higher heel shoe, where they just want to feel some arch support to mimic something they've got in their general shoes. Um, if you're wanting a rear foot correction, there isn't much space there to put anything in, you know. Can we invert it? We've had requests in the past of a cord hook device of 20 uh, degrees inverted. Now, if I was to generate 20 degrees inverted, that cord hook would have to be, you know, literally about five mil in from the lateral side so I can have some meat, so to speak, in, in the shell around the heel so I can put some pressure through there. Otherwise, if I invert that 20 degrees, all that surface through here will be sitting up in the air and it will just collapse when you put patient, the patient stands on it so you lose all the inversion. Or if you put a stabilizer, it will just push through the foot and generate a big line uh, demarcation and push the fat pad of the, uh, of the heel through the device. So it doesn't really work. So it's a low bulk device, low inversion device, okay? So there's our heel cup options. Now, all the heel cup options, are they um, that don't have any bearing on, on the amount of correction you have, whether the pressure or the correction or the high point of the arches, it's all independent from our arch field techniques, which is something we'll talk about next. Um, the only thing is um, with a concave wedge or, or a wedge device, which we've talked about before, as, as compared to a traditional orthotic, um, because we are removing the lateral heel cup, with a higher inverted device, once we remove the lateral heel cup, well, we, the lateral heel cup is actually a pronatory force. So once we remove that, we are adding more inversion to the device. So with a concave wedge, and what we found is at degrees, you no know, 10 plus, it does give you more, you do get more refoot correction with a concave wedge because you don't have the pronatory effect of, of the lateral heel cup. Um, so if you're doing a, an inverted orthotic of let's say, you know, 15 or 20 degrees, and you want to go to a concave wedge and you used to use a traditional orthotic, drop it by a couple of degrees. Um, so the patient A doesn't slide off or you don't overcorrect them. Um, and the benefit you get with a concave wedge of a higher inversion as opposed to a traditional orthotic is that A, you don't get the bulk of the orthotic around the heel cup and, and B, we are able to get the same amount of control with less inversion, which means the orthotic itself is actually lower bulk and sits lower inside the shoe. So it's a plus plus. If you're concerned that the patient will slide around, but then all means use a concave with a lateral heel cup or a traditional orthotic. All right, so we'll move on to, um, on to our next section and I've got to share the screen with you again. Um, Baz, thanks for prompting me. Uh, we, um, we have a few questions. Uh, oh, okay, cool. Thanks, mate. All right, so yeah if a heel stabilizer would be used um, in the traditional heel cup that has a high lateral heel clip? Yes, um, so you can use a, and heel stabilizers will be covered in section three. I think that we did a video uh, under modifications, but uh, with a lateral clip, uh, quite often a podiatrist will use a 
um, like I've got a full heel stabilizer here. Um, a podiatrist will use a, um, a half lateral stabilizer um, to actually give you just lateral stability um, and enhance uh, and promote that extra lateral wedging. So by all means, you can use a heel stabilizer or a heel stabilizer that's um, half lateral only and extend it more distally to actually get more wedging across there as well. Anything else? Oh, we have another question from Mark. Mark's asked if with court hook, do we specify what height the heel is to allow for bending of the device increased pitch? By all means, yes. So, um, and not how high the heel is, but the difference inside the shoe. Because if you've got a platform shoe, you know, you could have a six inch heel and a two inch uh, forefoot. There's only a difference of four inch as opposed to a straight six inch high shoe. So whatever the difference is between the heel and the forefoot inside the shoe itself, um, if they've got platform shoes, that all helps us. And we will physically design the orthotic so it actually sits um, at that height. Okay, so great question, Mark. Yeah, that's all. That's no. it? Okay, good. All right, so we'll move on to arch fill techniques. Um, with our arch fill techniques, we have a number of arch fill techniques, inverted, mid, modified root, as is, as is at zero. And then we have options with um, maximum, minimum, um, as well as a CB option. Now, some of these do double up, and this is our arch fill techniques have been developed over the years, and look, we've been doing this for 26 years now. Um, so when I started off at uni, all we're told, all we're told is, is a modified root and inverted. So uh, mid came in a little bit um, at the start just to give me a little bit of differentiation or, or something a little bit different than a mid or, uh, sorry, a modified root or an inverted device. So let's start off um, with a share and let's do one that I've here prepared earlier. Okay, so um, we'll go back to our design if I, um, move into transparency and hide that. So uh, there's, a, there's our orthotic design. So arch fill technique to begin with, when we've balanced the reef foot to zero, which I showed you uh, at the beginning, we give you 90% of the height of the arch, okay? So regardless of whether that is uh, a mid, a modified root, or, or an as is. So we'll bring the height of the arch to its maximum height. In this case, it's 29 millimeters. So 90% of that 10 mil less, so roughly three millimeters less three mil less, we drop it down to about 26. So there's my standard arch fill technique um, for, for, that, uh, for that device at refoot zero, okay? So now um, let's start with our uh, mid device, which is, used to be our most common. So our mid device high point is around the telonavicular region, um, or what I would term the proximal third of the arch. So if I was to divide the arch into threes, would start probably around here, sustentacular tail eye. Um, there's my proximal third, there's my distal third, and there's where my device finishes. So with a mid arch fill technique, we shift it slightly more proximal. And we'll just balance out the heel cup. And what that gives us, it gives us um, a, and I hope you can all see that, it gives us um, high point telonavicular region, gives us great calc inclination angle support. Um, so it pushes the high point more proximal and then it draws away um, and we might actually just drop that down a little bit more, draws away straight to the first MTPJ, not putting any pressure under the first ray, allowing the first ray to plant a flex. So that was a great device um, for a dynamic, what I would term a dynamic orthotic patient that needed calc inclination support for a neutral foot, um, not a really flat foot, but a more neutral foot um, and gave you some telonavicular correction as well. And still allowed for the first trait to plant the flex, mid-tassel joint to pronate, generate the windless mechanism. It did not gem up the first trait. Um, it worked great with people that walked around a lot um, and were dynamic. Um, however, if you had a job that you stood around for a long period of time, um, and that high point could become a problematic. Um, we've had cases where People said the orthotics are great uh, when I'm going for a walk or playing golf or uh, generally walking around. But if I'm standing around working at Bunnings, although I'm a hairdresser and stand around all day, um, I do get a bit of a hot spot or a sore spot develop uh, right through there. Also, patients would tell you when they first put the orthotics on that they didn't feel quite right because the pressure wasn't in the right spot. A lot of people, when they first get orthotics, they think they're going to have an arch support. Well, the pressure is not in the right spot for what they perceive it to be, but the pressure is in the right spot for the action that we want the device to actually achieve. 
So we actually want to increase the calc inclination angle. And a lot of you would have seen where I demonstrate how I show a patient where I want to place the pressure on the foot or actually um, put pressure through the arch. Um, with my hand, I push through the arch and the foot actually everts. Um, and when I apply pressure through sort of the sacrum tail up to the tail and the vicular joint and the foot nicely inverts. And I said, well, that's where exactly where we want to actually have the control point. And that was our mid arch foot technique. Um, so our next one, we then developed a, um, actually I'll digress a little bit. So that's our mid and our modified route um, will move slightly more distally. So modified route is a uh, more of a supportive device. So a modified route, the way we do it at footwork, it um, reduces the calc inclination angle support. Okay, so as you can see, I've got less pressure through the sort of telonavicular system tapon tela area, but I've got more pressure in the mid arch into the forefoot itself. As you can see there, I'm pushing into the um, first MTPJ and so forth. So, I'm uh, sorry, uh, into the first ray. Um, and a modified route, the way that we do it here at Footwork is a supportive orthotic. It's made for somebody who's got a four foot varus or supernatus. Now, I'm not going to get into arguments which one's which, um, but just someone who's got a four foot varus or a four foot supernatus deformity that you need to support where the first MTPJ does not come down to the ground. So, a, a four foot, um, somebody like that will generally be uh, presented as an elderly patient where they've been walking around for a long period of time and dorsiflex the first tray um, and they need support in the forefoot. And the way that I would test for that is simply do a basic test when I'm doing um, the biomechanical examination. I'll get the patient to stand um, in subtalar neutral stance position. If I can't get their first MCPJ to the ground, I've got to bring the ground back up to the foot, okay? And doesn't matter how much correction you would give a patient like that in the rear foot, sustentaculum, tail eye, tail and avicular joint, if that first MTPJ is not getting to the ground because they don't have the range of motion or don't have the muscle strength to do it, they'll pronate on top of the orthotic and the orthotic will feel hard. And is it feeling hard because it's made from semi-rigid or plastic material? Or does it feel hard because you've got the pressure in the wrong part of the foot? So modified root device, um, again, um, just like uh, uh, in a case where you would need it, if you use it in a case uh, where you, there is first ray function, the patient, again, will feel pressure through under the first ray. And as you can see clearly from the image here, where you get rubbing as the patient's trying to plant the flex the first ray. So it is what I would term a supportive device. You do not generate the windless mechanism. It just supports the foot in its location. And most of the patients you'd give a modified root device to would be um, very low activity level, um, you know, just shuffling around around the house, like I said, elderly patients, or a really deformed foot that requires that sort of a device. So that's our modified route. So we had those two choices, a mid or a modified route. So how about we have a device that gives us a bit of both. So we came up over the years with a mid-modified root combination where we literally go halfway in between, in between the two. And one of the other, other issues we had with a mid-device was plantar anthesopathy or medial calc tubicle pain because it did give us pressure straight through a mid calc tubicle. So with a mid-modified root, we would actually contour the arch very much as close as it is. Um, Give us, giving us um, some space under the first tray for it to be able to plant a flex, but we just move that high point a little bit further more distally and just contour the arch exactly as it is, okay? Hence the name as is. Now, we still keep referring to as a mid-modified root, but 99% of mid-modified root arch field techniques and as is are pretty much one and the same. Um, and the reason we've changed it is just easier to explain to new podiatrists as we've grown um, across Australia and globally. Um, so an as-is arch field technique, which we'll refer to it from now on. So there's no more mid-modified route. An as-is arch field technique, as you can see, it, it is right there. When would you use it? Um, someone who does not really need that rear foot correction, high calc inclination angle, a little bit less activity level. Um, you know, they're not really going running, not a lot of walking, just general purpose use and they just need good control and support and thus draw some of the area away from the mid calc tubicle as well. So it's probably a really good option to use with um, people with a mid calc tubicle pain and so forth. 
Now, our last one is an inverted orthotic. So an inverted orthotic, the way that we do it here at Footwork, um, the high point is at the sustentacton tail eye. So with an inverted device, we literally go where the high point is around the bridge of the marker, okay? And that is a very low looking device, as you can see. Um, the way that we gain control or increase control of, on that device is by inversion. And as we invert it, as you can see, the high point increases. Now, we do have to adjust it at a higher inversion level because the heel cup gets a little bit skewed, but that's really easily done. Um, so that's at 10 degrees. If I was to go to 15 and 20 degrees, correction, as you can see, it gets at 20 degrees. It does become a um, higher controlling device, but it does not give you any pressure through the arch. So an inverted orthotic uh, you would use with somebody who's got a lot of frontal plane uh, movement in their subtalar joint. So there isn't any calc inclination angle requirement. So the calc inclination, uh, the, um, the axis of um, subtalar joint axis is pretty much declined. It's not um, at 45 degrees like it is in the neutral foot, but it's lower than 45 degrees, which allows for much more frontal plane movement, inversion, eversion in a device. Okay. Um, generally speaking, you'll find that with people with really hypermobile flat, flat feet, a lot of kids will benefit from an inverted orthotic the way that we do it here at Footwork. Um, and the correction range of that will be between anywhere from 15 to 25 degrees, 15 being mild and 25 degrees being aggressive. So that's our inverted device. Um, any questions? Baz? Uh, no, no, nothing yet. No, nothing yet. Okay. So, so let me have a look quickly at, um, at our portal and inverted mid, oh, optional arch fills and so forth. Okay. So now we'll cover optional and then inversions. Now, with our, let me just open recent, open that up again. So we'll go back to our standard art shape. Um, so we'll go back to our original design. So we balance the reef with at zero, give you 90% of the height of the arch. So that's our standard. If you select minimum arch fill, we'll give you 100% of the height of the arch. So that's an as is, and we'll give you 100% of the height of the arch, which is around three millimeters higher for the average foot. Um, so there's your minimum. Um, with a, we'll go back down to standard, which is was 26 in that case. And a maximum arch fill technique, we'll drop it down by another three mil, take it down to about 23. Um, and there's your maximum arch fill technique, okay? So you have the ability to drop the arch higher or lower um, from where the high point was. So that's an as is, and we do exactly the same thing if it was a mid. Um, except the high point will be slightly more proximal. So there's a mid with a maximum arch fill, or if it was a modified route, we just bring it a little bit more distally, okay? And adjust it a bit more so it looks a little bit better. So this is like literally doing a pl virtual plaster. So that would be a modified route with a maximum arch fill. So a maximum arch fill drops the arch height. Um, when would you use it? A minimum arch fill, obviously you want maximum control, maximum pressure. Um, and a maximum arch fill, you would probably use it with someone who's got a hypermobile foot where you're uh, concerned that the arch um, will, under, upon weight bearing would actually collapse a little bit um, more than standard and, and get some irritation through the orthotics. So a maximum arch fill will give you that um, a modification. Um, you can also specify the height of the arch. Um, whatever you need. There is, a number, there is a number of podiatrists that do that with us where they literally will say, doesn't matter what degree of correction, I want the high point to be the same as an as is. So generally like that. Um, and I want the arch height to be, you know, 30 millimeters high. So just like that, as you can see, that's a lot higher than a standard. We're cutting into the foot in this case. And if I was to uh, generate my mesh, as you can see, I'm cutting right into the foot. There's a lot of pressure going through that region. Um, but podiatrist requested 30 mil um, of arch height, and we can do that. Um, now, we will have a, um, a webinar with one of those podiatrists. We, we are organizing it now once we finish this series on how to measure, how they go around measuring the arch height and how they'll work out what they want. Because there is a handful of clinics that we deal with 
that do it pretty much 99% of the time. They'll specify exactly the R chart. It makes the job really easy for us um, because from the measurements, we can give you exactly what you want. So that's another one. Um, the other option that we have is, um, is a CB modification. Now, a CB modification was designed to increase the calc inclination angle. So if we go back to our mid arch fill technique, okay, um, like I said to you previously, a mid arch fill technique gives us a really nice um, calc high calc inclination angle support. So the high point is more proximal, but it does not really contour the foot really well. So what if you wanted a, an as is or something that contours the foot, but you still then want that high point to be stretched more proximal, giving you more of that calc, in, calc inclination angle support. So that's our CB modification. Um, and what it gives you, it just spreads the weight more, into, gives you more support into the midfoot as well as that high calc inclination angle support. Where we found it to be really, really useful is with what I call um, a teenage um, adolescent feet where you've got a non-weight bearing, a high arched foot. So you've got a high calc inclination angle and the subtalar joint movement is, is uh, not just frontal plane, but it moves equally in all three planes, probably even less in the frontal plane. But the foot is so hypermobile that upon weight bring the arch collapses. So in the past, what we used to do is just give you an inverted orthotic or some sort of a hybrid of an inverted orthotic because the only way we could control it is a lot of refoot inversion. Um, and look, it did control the foot. It gave you great uh, control of the subtalar joint. But in a lot of those cases, the feet looked kind of contorted on top of the inside the shoe. Um, and, and a lot of the kids tended to complain that they, you know, not quite com as comfortable as they could be. Um, so with a CB modification and an as is, what we're getting through here is a calc inclination support, which gives you that high calc, um, high axis of um, subtalar joint movement support. But we continue that support throughout the foot and where the foot collapses, we can actually thin the shell out, thus allowing it to collapse a little bit. So we're getting control of the foot, the foot sits on it how it should be, um, getting great refoot correction um, and still getting some correction through to the midfoot, but then taking it away from the midfoot through a thinner arch. And the way that you ask for it is just ask for the arch to be thinner than the rest of the shell in comments. Um, again, that's a modification that will become a standard in multi-zone um, thickening and thinning out on the next update of our portal. Um, but that works really well with what I would term as a, um, a high arched hypermobile foot. So an as is with a CB modification and a thinner arch. And particularly with active kits, um, we found really great compliance and great, res great results with it. And some of those kids were actually podiatrists own kids that they've tried it with. And like I mentioned previously in the past, we're using uh, inverted devices or some sort of a hybrid of an inverted device to gain the control. And the foot sits better in a shoe as well because we're not lifting it up with the inversion. Um, and if you don't have the frontal plane um, movement in the subtalar joint where the heel doesn't just invert and roll, if it doesn't have that movement, an invert orthotic will just lift the heel out of the shoe. So um, this is where the CB modification uh, becomes really handy. Again, um, be careful with mid calc tubicle pain, okay? Um, because we do put a lot of pressure on that region. Um, so if I was to generate my mesh now, and you can actually see exactly where we're putting the pressure through here, okay? So that's a really good demonstration. That's what a CB does. It gives you pressure right through that anterior part of the calcaneus um, and supporting the high calc inclination angle. And that's where your mid calc tubicle is. If for some reason you want to use that top of a device, you find that that's what you need for a patient with uh, to support and, and gain the, um, the, uh, the function of the orthotic with mid calc tubicle pain, by all means, you can actually ask for a sweet spot in that area. Uh, we'll cover that in, in the next session when we go into modifications. So that's our CB. Now, a CB modification, you can't use it with an inverted device because the high point is already beyond that. And we don't use it or we wouldn't recommend it uh, with a mid device, again, because the high point is already there. The whole purpose of a CB device is to 
give you more control through the midfoot, but stretching it further back and give you that nice overall control through the foot itself, but particularly supporting your um, high calc inclination angle. Okay, so let's have a look. What else have we got on um, on our so uh, new share? Um, and da, 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 where's my portal? Um, it's here. Okay, so we've talked about CB, minimum, maximum, archfield technique. We got any questions there, Baz? Uh, no, no, no. No, okay, cool. The last thing we'll talk about is, um, is uh, uh, rear foot correction, okay? Our four foot correction we'll cover together with, because this one's stretching out a little bit, we're about to hit an hour, so we'll go a bit over an hour. So the four foot correction we'll cover with shell materials and, uh, and modifications. So we'll just go into rear foot correction. Um, so I'll go back and share uh, my design screen. And if I go back, open recent, I've learned this from doing my other so I didn't have to redesign everything. I just opened my previous window. So let's talk about rear foot correction. Um, the way that we apply rear foot correction here at Footwork is again, starting from the back, from, from, uh, from the beginning, we balance your cast or your scan to rear foot zero, design the arch fill technique whatever the shape is be, it would be. So in this case, we've got an as is um, um, at zero degrees. And then we add a refoot correction to it. So as we add refoot correction to the device, as you can see here, I can move that refoot correction. The arch height increases or, or decreases if I go into E version. So if I go into four degrees, the arch height will increase by about two millimeters. Okay. So um, the rule of thumb is around uh, two millim around half a millimeter for every degree of correction, the arch height will change. Now that's a fairly small foot, 151 millimeters. The average foot is around the sort of 165 to 170 um, mil long. Um, so that will be slightly less than half a millimeter. So when you add your correction, you know whether it's four degrees, six or eight, that's how, um, if I go into my posterior view and then I have to bring that up as a, as a twist and follows below, falls below the surface. Q medial, I'll give you that view again, transparency and hide walls. That is, for example, an a, as is at 10 degrees, um, it starts becoming fairly high, as you can see, um, fairly high, fa fairly aggressive looking device. So, um, the, re the only difference with the inversion is an as is at zero. So if I was to go back to zero degrees with this, with any device that we uh, add refoot correction to, the arch height changes. With an as is at zero, the arch height does not change. And the way that we achieve it is we literally take a note of the arch height. So in here, I've got 25 millimeters height of the arch. If I wanted to make that, you know, 15 degrees, I'll put 15 degrees um, and I'll bring that back down to 25 millimeters. So now I've got 15 degrees of refoot correction, okay? But the arch height is as it was at zero. So the whole purpose of um, as is at zero is that you can have any amount of correction in the refoot and the arch height remains the way that the car sits at zero. Where is it useful? We had a case like that today. Um, the podiatrist is watching us today where, you know, he w had a patient who required a lot of refoot correction. He wanted that arch to be contoured, but did not want um, the, the arch height to be increased at all. Uh, he actually wanted a maximum arch fill. So then as is at zero with a maximum arch fill at 10 degrees and, and the device came out looking quite low. Um, in such a case, it would look like something like this. So. In the older days, when we talked about hybrids, that would have been more like a inverted modified root combination. Um, right now, um, again, we're talking to podiatrists who haven't dealt with us for a long time, so we've got to come up with new some terminology. So new way for asking for that would just be as is maximum arch fill, um, as is at zero maximum arch fill at 10 degrees, or this one's actually 15 degrees of, of refoot correction. Okay, so, um, the only difference between and as is at zero and anything else, the arch height does not change with our refoot correction. One last thing that I should probably um, mention too, um, arch fill techniques such as mid um, modified root, as is and as is at zero, 
to take the height of the arch of the foot into account. With an inverted orthotic, we do not because we place the high point at the system taking tail light and it is a anatomical marker that we use on a foot. So it does not take into account the height of the arch on the foot, okay? Um, you can still use a maximum and a minimum arch fill on an inverted. Maximum arch fill, probably not so much because it's already so low, but by all means a minimum arch fill. So we just increase it by three millimeters. <coughs> Sorry, voice is getting a bit high. Um, increase it by three millimeters. Um, so with, a, with the arch fill technique, what I'm trying to get across is that whether if you get a, uh, a pair of feet, a couple of scans, and, and there is a distinct difference between the left and the right arch heights, and you ask for 20 degrees on both, both devices will come back looking the same because we do not take the arch height into account when designing an inverted orthotic, okay? So the high point is purely just around the rear foot. Um, any questions, Baz? Yeah, we have, no? we have, yeah, we have one question, um, and it's based around if the designer contacts the pod in case he might see a bit of a mistake in the device. So for example, if an arch height is around 30 mils and you were saying earlier they might dig into the arch, would the designer contact the pod or would this be something that you might just let, uh, that you might not proceed with? Okay, so um, if the, the understanding we have the podiatrist that we deal with is that if you ask for a specific measurement um, that, um, of the arch height, we will go with that. If it's something that looks ridiculous, um, then by all means, we will contact you. Um, we also have, uh, every now and we'll get a message from a podiatrist saying, can you uh, send me the image prior to proceeding so I can check what it looks like? So we'll literally design it just like that, take a screenshot and, um, and send it to you so you can actually see what it looks like. Now, that feature will be available um, on our portal um, in the near future. So we are working in the background. Um, I was hoping to have it um, probably sometime halfway through this year, but with everything that's happening around COVID and some of the changes we've had to make, we will um, uh, it'll probably be more like another six to nine months. But what you literally see is the design of the orthotic itself um, around the cast, just like I'm doing here, uh, the final design um, on the portal before you submit your, um, your prescription. So you'll be able to review it, adjust it, change your prescription, reset it, and it'll come back again. And it'll be literally, you know, a handful of seconds depending on the, in, on the internet speed. So that feature is coming to be uh, as live on our portal as well as we further develop um, our software. Um, but by all means, we do make those phone calls and that's what your job with us is, isn't it, Basil? How many phone calls do you make a day? About 10 to 15. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, and we have um, two podiatrists doing their job at any one time. So um, we do make a lot of phone calls and follow-ups. If there's something that does not make sense, the way we look at it, we'll give you a buzz. Um, the only thing, please keep in mind, if, um, if you do ask us to contact you or you ask for some sort of a um, clarification on our chart or, or design shape, it might take us a couple of days to get back to you um, or, or no, not get back to you, to get in touch with you because we'll do it straight away on the day that we receive it. Um, and that may delay our, our manufacture process. So just keep that in mind if we can't reach you. Um, if you want it to be five day turnaround and it takes us three days to reach you, that's going to have to be extended. Otherwise we, we stretch with rapid returns and so forth. So is there anything else? We have one more from Rami. Um, he asked, if we specify arch heights for left and right devices, the rear foot correction would then not alter the arch heights when you design the orthotic, regardless of orthotic type. No, um, the arch height is calculated once the rear foot correction is, is, is done. Okay, so the arch height is the final measurement. So if you ask, uh, if you ask for an arch height of, um, of 30 millimeters with, with two degrees, on the left and 30 millimeters of uh, arch height with six degrees on the right, they'll both be at 30 mil, uh, but the refoot correction will be set at two and six correspondingly. So the, the arch height is the final measurement after everything else is added. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys. That was a, a little bit quicker, just on an hour. So perfect timing. Um, if you have any further questions, anything to add to, please shoot us an email to info at footwork.com.au and we'll see you next week or whenever you log in for the next one. So thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone.